church and we love our fathers. We love the men. Thank you for sending the photos in. I was deeply appreciative of not only your families, but how much facial hair that we groove at this church. You guys look great. But we love men for so many reasons. Namely, you are created in the likeness and the image of God. God has a special touch on your life and you are unique. And you are wonderfully and you are beautifully made. And God has stamped his image on your life. And you, we are different. There is a different in genders. We do not uh, homogenize all things. We are different because God created us different. One not better than the other, but different for his glory. And one way we know we're different is just men are different. And we can track that because women typically live longer than men. And that's not a DNA issue, that is uh, a common sense issue. Let me just make my argument to you this morning in a little segment we call, Why Women Live Longer Than Men. First of all is, sometimes men in our engineering is not necessarily the best. As you'll notice right here, here's a group of men who need to get some heavy equipment down. So let's get the forklift and lift up another forklift on the forklift and then raise that forklift up. And the guy in the middle forklift decides I'm not even going to sit in the seat. I'm going to balance it on the backside. How about this? Guys, we all have to change light bulbs. I get the call all the time from the house. Here's a guy who decides, yes, I will change the light bulb of the street. A ladder on top of a table. On, uh, dear Lord. Certainly appreciate our... Soldiers, our men, especially those on the bomb team. Uh, here's a picture of why women live longer than guys. Here's a guy saying, hey, buddy, hold that bomb real stick. We must have cross-threaded the detonator. Let me hit it with this hammer and see if I can fix it. Another example of why women live longer than men. And of course, men were generally cheapskates at heart, and nothing is greater than free cable, right? Here's a guy who thought, hey, I heard this from a pal at work. I think I'll climb up. And oh, yeah, there's the reason that women live longer than men. Uh, this guy, uh, you know, if there's one chore I don't like, it's trimming the hedges. Trisha stays on. Those hedges grow quicker than anything in my life, it seems like. And I don't love to do it. And this guy, no doubt, had heard it from his wife. Hey, babe, you need to get out and trim the hedges. <laughs> so he says, hey, here's a good idea. I'm going to rent a crane, hook the snapper up to it, engage the blades, and I will go across and trim the hedges. And maybe this is my favorite one. This guy here, you know, I don't know what the hazmat team is looking at, but chances are, he's like, hey, Bob, come over here and check this out. You won't believe this. I hope you're loving the men in your life today. I hope you're appreciating all that they are. Well, the Bible gives us so many examples of fatherhood. We could, we could just go through a long, long list of men in the Bible that we can learn great truths and principles from, but there is no one that even comes quote close to giving us the imagery of true fatherhood greater than Father God himself. And today I want to take a look at how Father God loved his son, his only begotten Jesus Christ, and the words that he spoke to his son that were so impactful, no doubt, to Jesus and something that you and I can learn together. Because I believe that every man here who is blessed with being a father, uh, you long to be a great father. And I tell you, that syncs up with the heart of your father in heaven. And God wants us to be great men of God who are great fathers, both biological fathers, but also spiritual fathers to those young men and women and those people in our life that we can encourage and inspire so if you have your Bibles, if you would meet me at Matthew chapter number 3, Matthew chapter number 3, we'll look at just a couple of verses, verses 16 and 17. As you're turning, let me give you the context. This is at the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry. He's probably around the age of 30. He has lived the vast majority of his life up in the northern region of the nation of Israel, the region of Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, up to this moment, there have been no recounts of him performing miracles or teaching or doing any of that which we know Jesus for. This is the, the beginning of his ministry, and he's making his way to the Jordan River where his cousin John the Baptist is baptizing people as they are repenting and turning their hearts towards God, preparing for the coming of Messiah, the Messiah that Jesus is. 
Jesus makes his way out to the river. He goes out and he greets John and says, John, I need to be baptized. John says, no, I need to baptize you. And Jesus said, no, no, no. In order for all righteousness to be fulfilled, let this happen. And John agrees. And there with a multitude of people, a throng of humanity, who are turning their hearts towards God, Jesus is baptized and something so powerful, so profound happens that I don't want us to miss it today on this Father's Day. Matthew chapter 3, beginning with verse number 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And a voice from heaven said, this is the voice of God, said, This is my Son, whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. Will you bow with me for a word of prayer and ask God to open your heart to His message today. Father, we love you because you first loved us. You are a good, good Father. Father, we know you want to speak to us today, to every person, every man, every woman, everyone who's older and everyone who's younger. Wherever we are, whatever station of life, you have a word for us because you're a good father. So Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing unto you this morning. You, our God, our rock, our salvation, in Christ's name we pray. And together we said, Amen. Amen. The words that you and I speak are powerful. Matter of fact, words themselves are powerful. God, our Father in heaven, he framed all of creation, the world that we live in, our universe, through the spoken word. And we see that throughout the word of God, the power of words. The scriptures teach us, Uh, That life and death are in the power of our tongue. And the words that we speak can literally bring life and hope and encouragement and strength to those who hear those words. Or they can be words that bring discouragement and pain, confusion, and destruction to life. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29, the Apostle Paul gives us this admonition concerning our words. He says, let no corrupt speech, no corrupt words come out of your mouth, but only speak that which is necessary for edification that builds up so that you may be able to impart grace to those who hear your words. He says, let no corrupt word, that word corrupt means no spoiled, no rotten words come out of your mouth. I had a real revelation about this passage several years ago. One morning as I was getting ready, Tricia said as she was standing in her kitchen, something in this house is sour. And I said, I noticed it too as I came downstairs. It smelled like, you know, a a soured washcloth. We looked around and we couldn't find it. And we wiped down the counters and thought, well, maybe we got it. Well, the next morning it was a lot worse. It wasn't just a sour washcloth. Now it smelled like rotten eggs. We began wondering what in the world has happened. And we went through the refrigerator and we thought something must have spoiled. Or maybe some of the fruit on the counter had gone bad and we had just missed it. But we couldn't find it. The third day, it was so horrible. We were convinced that something had crawled up under our house in the crawl st- space and it died. Maybe a squirrel or a rabbit or a cat. And Trisha said, you've got to fix this. We can't live in this house like this. This is terrible. Well, I went under the crawl space, under the house, and I looked around. We couldn't find it. And I said, I don't know what it could be. She said, well, maybe, maybe it was a mouse or something got behind the refrigerator. Why don't you pull out the refrigerator? So I put my hands on either side of the refrigerator. I looked up. And there, as I looked at our tall refrigerator, I saw the source of the wretched odor. Now, let me take you back four days previous. I had taken Chandler and Taylor fishing, and we had caught a lot of fish. 
We were so proud of our stringer of fish. And we brought those fish home and we cleaned them and we talked about, we're going to put them in the freezer and in two weeks we're going to invite your grandparents over and we'll have a fish fry. It will be wonderful. We could not wait. And as we were cleaning those fish and putting them in the freezer bag, I walked them over to the freezer. And as I opened the door with my hand, I realized there was no space in the freezer. So I took the fish that was in my left hand and I put it on top of the refrigerator. I organized the freezer. I put the other fish in, closed the door. And now four days later, I'm looking up there and those filet of fish now were more like a smoothie of fish. (laughs) You would be amazed at the gag reflex in our home as I held that up and it just oozed and reeked. That's what Paul is talking about, our words. He says, don't allow any type of putrid, rotten words to come out of your mouth. But make sure the words that you speak are life-giving. Here in a critical moment of Jesus' life, as he is beginning his public ministry, as he is following the Father's words to be baptized, God Almighty, His Heavenly Father, speaks words of life to His Son. And I believe these are words that all of us desperately within ourselves, long to hear. So dads, I want to give you three words that I pray would be a part of your lexicon going forward. I pray these would be three practices that we see the Father practice and offer us in His love and His fatherhood over His Son, Jesus, and that we would emulate that and we would copy that and we would speak these same type of words. And the first words that we hear Him speak are words of identity. Words of identity. As Jesus comes up out of the water, God the Father speaks from above and he says, This is my, say it with me, son. The Father is publicly, openly identifying with his son. One of the great questions that we all struggle with in our humanity is this Who am I? Where did I come from? Who do I sync up with? Do I really matter? It's an identification issue. I remember as a boy growing up on my grandparents' farm, they would send me into town at times and uh, they would ask me, hey, whose boy are you? Who do you belong with? That is a question of identity. And what we discover here is the Father in heaven is giving to Jesus what all of us need. And that is a sense of our own identity in the Father. These are precious words. These are powerful words. I want you to notice that it was not just Jesus in this moment identifying with the Father through obedience. This was the Father identifying with the Son. It wasn't just the Son saying, I am here to please my Father. I am here to obey my Heavenly Father. This was the Heavenly Father saying, this is my boy. There's something about being claimed. There is something about belonging. So many of us, we have watched The orphans who spend so much of their lives searching desperately, trying to find their parents or anything about their background, wanting to know what is my identity. The children of Israel who I referenced earlier, for 400 years they had lived as slaves. Therefore they had a slave mentality. And when God brought them out of Egypt, He had to change their identity and the way they viewed themselves. They were no longer slaves. They were no longer just someone else's doormat. The Father brings them to Sinai and He says, You are my special treasure. You are a people that I have chosen for Myself. He says, I delight in you. He says, not only will you be my people, but I will be your God. And what sons and daughters need from their fathers is they need that sense of identity. I belong here. This is who I am. 
Your sons and your daughters, men, need to hear you proudly say, this is my son. That's my daughter. This is my family. Jesus, I have no idea, no hesitation in my mind that the father didn't go, yeah, that's my son. Yeah, he's, he's not really accomplished much, 30 years old, not got a job. He said, this is my son. The power of being identified as a son. One of our favorite songs at Grace Fellowship is the song, Who You Say That I Am. It was written by Hillsong. And it says, in my father's house, there is a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say that I am. You are for me and not against me. I am who you say that I am. He who the son sets free is free indeed. I am a child of God. Yes, I am. And though we are a reflection, though a broken reflection... Just as we need to hear those words from our Heavenly Father that we belong to Him, your sons and daughters, they need to hear you say, you belong to me. You're my son. You're my daughter. The second word I want you to put in your lexicon is this, are words of affection. Words of affection. Not only the Father openly and publicly give Jesus words of identification, He gave Him words of pure, unconditional affection. Notice the order of the Father's words over Christ. This is my Son, whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. The order of this is so important. Don't miss this. If the Father had said, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased, and in whom I love, then His love becomes a conditioned response by God Himself. Because Jesus has performed well. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And because he got it right, he marked off all the important uh, characteristics of his life. Now I love him. That's not what the father said. The father said to the son, you are my son. I love you. It is an expression of unconditional love that you don't have to earn my love. You don't have to measure up to my love. You don't have to get it all right for you to receive my love. What a beautiful expression of God the Father. And we see that throughout the entirety of the text that God is saying to each of us, I love you unconditionally. And he speaks it over and over and over and over and over and over again in the Bible. Can I get an amen? Amen. He says, I love you, Abraham. I love you, Isaac. I love you, Jacob. I love you, Israel. Matter of fact, the prophet says, That you are the apple of your father's eye. That God loves you so much. He sings a song of rejoicing over you. And men, though we are fallen, though redeemed, we should model to our children and our families this type of affectionate love to our sons and daughters. We verbalize it. I love you. My father, three years ago, coming up on the anniversary, passed away from complications of West Nile virus. He'd gone down to Florida, apparently got bitten by a mosquito and began the process of about a month's decline before his death. On the last day that I am with my dad and before he had to be ventilated, I'm spending time with him, and as I get ready to leave the room and say goodbye to him, he grabs me by the hand, and he holds my hand, and he rubs my arm. And the last words my father would ever speak to me are those three words. I love you. The next morning, they would have to put him on a ventilator in which he would never come off of. I can't tell you the... The gift that that is, that my father's final words to me were, I love you. But it's not overwhelming. You know why? Because my father consistently told me throughout my life, Tony, I love you. 
Tony, you were mine. I never questioned my father's love. Because he spoke those words over my life. And then his conduct and his actions towards my life affirmed that which he spoke. Was my dad perfect? He wasn't. He would have been the first to tell you. But he loved me and he spoke these words over my life. There would not be a time we'd get off the phone, we'd say goodbye to one another, that he wouldn't come up. And he would affectionately hug me, kiss me on my neck, and say, I love you. It's a game changer in my life. And I can tell you it can be a game changer in your sons' and daughters' lives. Words of affection. This is my son whom I love. And then finally, words of affirmation. In whom I am well pleased. In whom I am well pleased. Dads, I don't know that we really recognize how powerful it is when we affirm our children. If they're small children or if they're adult children, there is power in the words of affirmation. There's something powerful that happens in our children's lives when we say things like this out of a sincere, truthful heart, I am proud of you. I saw you stand courageously in that moment. I am proud of you, son. I'm proud of you, daughter. I saw how you stood by your Christian convictions and you did not cave in. But you stood bold for your Savior. I am proud of you. I saw how you were compassionate to that person who is in need and less fortunate and who is underserved and you have a heart to serve those. That's how Christ would serve. And I see that in you and I'm proud of you. I affirm the character of Christ that I see growing in your life. I see the Lord working in your life. I see the character of Jesus being manifest in your life. All of us long for that type of affirmation in our life. To suggest we don't is to lie to the very core of our being. We long for you. Go to any little league baseball game if they ever start up again. When you see that little kid hit the ball off the tee or makes his catch or throws it the first, the kid can't even get to first base without him running like this to see what? To see if dad's there cheering him on. You did it. You did it. I'm proud of you. And that doesn't end at seven years old. Fifteen-year-olds need that. Twenty-years-old, thirty-year-olds, forty. We need these words of affirmation. The father spoke them over his son. Why in the world would we not speak them over our sons and daughters? My son, in whom I love and in whom I'm well pleased. I can still remember 34, 35 years ago, I was a sophomore in high school playing football. And, and we ran this one play and I wasn't carrying the ball or anything like that. But I had the privilege to play on varsity at that point, And I had made a play and it was a good play, but it wasn't something that most people see. And I remember when the coach blew the whistle, he stopped the entire practice and he pointed me out for the play I made. Dude, I can remember that word of affirmation and my hard work in accomplishing something that set my heart. I, it, it stopped the clock for me. I remember when I uh, was in college and Dr. Hernandez was my speech communications teacher. And I remember after the first speech I gave, he sent me a little note and said, Mr. Vismore, please come into my office. I thought, oh, this is not going to be good. Because when I was in high school, the last time I gave a public speech was my senior lit paper. And I remember standing there just sweating drips of stress just dropping off my page, my face onto my page. And I was shaking like this and it was so nervous I couldn't even read it and my voice was trembling. And, and, and uh, Miss McDowell told me, my English teacher, she said, baby, whatever you do, don't become a public speaker. <laughs> and I thought, oh, Dr. Hernandez is about to land in the middle of me. He brings me in and he says, I don't know if you're a Christian or not. It doesn't matter, but I want to say something to you. There is a grace gift that God has given you to communicate and you will be my project. It stopped the clock for me. 
I remember it like yesterday. I remember when I was in college, I worked for uh, a business right next to me where my dad was. Nepotism at its finest. I got the job because of my dad. And one day after class, I was at work and I was going over, over to see my dad. And my dad was in the hallway and he's talking to some guys and he was talking about me. And he talked about how proud he was of me. He talked about my character. I'm telling you, it stopped the clock for me at the moment. It did something inside. The power of affirmation. Well, if you were raised in the greatest decade of them all, like me, the 80s, and you were into football at all, you remember there was a guy who came onto the scene uh, that really stole. Before there was Bo Knows Everything, there was this guy named Brian Bosworth. Brian Bosworth was a middle linebacker from the University of Oklahoma, and he was a beast. I mean, all-American. He's the only football player in history in NCAA who has won the Dick Buckus Award for Best Linebacker in the Nation two years in a row. No one has ever done that other than Bosworth. He was a wrecking machine. He was so powerful. He was so transcendent as a player. When you watched him on television, you watched the linebacker as the play began. You didn't watch the offense. You watched him because you knew that Bosworth was going to be somewhere around that ball and he was going to get there in a hurry. And when he did, it was going to be violent. It was great. (laughs) Well, Brian Bosworth developed this persona called the Boz. Mullet, big haircut, painted his hair, just almost like this superhero, this big marketing thing. And I mean, and he was on Sports Illustrated magazine. He was always in the press. He made it into the NFL. He was the number one draft pick of the Seattle Seahawks. And at that point, he had received the highest paying contract of anyone in the NFL, uh, $11 million over 10 years. I know it sounds like peanuts now, but that was huge money back in the mid-80s. Then he got injured and his retire, his, his, he had to retire, but he wrote a book. He was the number two best, uh, New York Times bestseller list, number two in the nation for weeks. And then he just sort of faded. A few years ago, ESPN and their great documentary series, 30 for 30, went back and they did a story on Brian Bosworth. It was called Brian and the Boz. And I remember when it came out, I was so excited to listen to it and learn about it because I wanted to know what really made this guy tick because he was a great ball player. I mean, he was motivated. He was a marketing genius. He had it all. I mean, the world was his oyster. He must have really, I want to know what makes this thing tick. Well, as they showed the documentary, you discovered that this was not a healthy young man. This was a broken young man. And what led to his brokenness more than anything else other than his own sin was a broken relationship with his dad. That no matter what he tried to do, he could never satisfy his dad. And what he wanted to do any, more than anything else was to get an, affirma- an affirming word from his dad. He and his son show up at a, uh, utility, oh, uh, a, a, a storage rental place where he had rented a storage room. And he had taken all, Brian had taken all his stuff and he had stored it for years and said, that's a part of my old life, I'm not going back. But now he has a teenage son and part of the documentary, they go back into that room. And I want to just show you a snippet of what this guy who had the world by the tail, who seemed to be on the top of his game, how inside he was so broken because of the lack of an affectionate dad. Here it is. When it came to sports, it was never good enough. Didn't play well enough. What did you do wrong on that play? There was always something wrong with something that I did. And I know what he was doing. I know he was just trying to push me to a place that he wanted me to go. All right. There you go. Big folder. Big script. Oh, look at that. I mean, look at this. He kept his own personal stats. Brian Bosworth had 75 yards on 15 carries. Bosworth, 28 rushes, 102 yards, 101 yards total gain, 3.6 average. I mean, he, why can't you just watch the game and be okay with it? After a game, 
coming out of the locker room, I remember his dad uh, walking up to me and pointing out and saying, hey, John D., uh, yes, solid game. And then two minutes later, I turned around, Brian was walking out with me, and I see him, and he's, he's up against the wall, and he's got a tongue lashing for whatever reason that day. And I'm certain Brian had just as good a game, if not a better game than anybody on that field. But meeting Foster's expectations, that was, that was tough. You get done with the practice or you get done with the game, and there was just a harpooning at the end of that as to everything that could have, should have been done differently. I don't know what he was expecting out of his kid, but I felt like he crossed the line at that point. Whatever he did, his dad wanted more. He could never get just a big hug, great game, fabulous, you had 20 tackles. Well, you know, how'd you miss him on that sweep? How'd you get pulled on the bootleg? His dad would make him run laps after practice. Dad wasn't even the coach. I don't ever remember Brian at that point in time talking about how absolutely hard, you know, my dad is on me or I'm this miserable, you know. We could watch and see the kind of pressure he was under. We didn't have to, he didn't have to tell us the story. When I was in high school, people think that I must have been cocky and had this way about me, and it's quite the contrary. I was dressed the wrong way, my hair was messed up, and I had too many pimples on my face. So I had all kinds of insecurity issues going in, and then I had some serious doubt issues as to my ability as a football player, and I played scared. And the only way I could learn to survive it was just to floor it full throttle and go as fast as I could without care about what happened to me. It was just a kid that was not sure what was driving him, and what was driving him was much darker than I think he wanted to let on. It seemed like no matter how well I played, because I played offense, I played defense, and you know I would score all the touchdowns or a lot of them and make a lot of the tackles, but. I never seemed to be able to do enough. What was that? I don't know. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why I couldn't make him happy. I don't know what it was about. I think it something I just couldn't give him. God, look at this stuff. Just a lifetime. There's more to life than paper clippings and accolades and rewards. If you can't meet the expectations, it doesn't mean that you're less of a man. There's my degree, University of Oklahoma. So he kept my degree. But man, there was a lot of pain. I didn't feel like I could ever just meet his expectations. Let's put this stuff away. Fame, fortune, celebrity, more money than he could spend. But what he wanted more than anything else and needed more than anything else was a father who could say proudly, this is my son whom I love and in whom I'm well pleased. Brian's dad was never able to get there. Brian came to this place in his own journey where he realized that what was broken in him was much deeper than just what was missing from his earthly dad. And he realized that what he needed is he needed a relationship with his heavenly dad. About seven years ago, Brian Bosworth came to the end of himself and he repented and he trusted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And Brian said in his testimony, and guys, I would encourage you, if you have some time today, just Google Brian Bosworth's testimony. It's powerful about God filling that deep, immense hole of brokenness in his life that gave him validation of his identity, that he was lovable, he was deserving of love, and that his life mattered. And Brian understood also that because of the great love of God that had been shed abroad in his life, that he could forgive his dad. So this is how I want us to close this morning. For some of you dads, you know, I pray to God this is a wake-up call for us. 
that we're just driving our kids all the time. We're just, you know, ne- it's never good enough. It's ne- it, that isn't about excellence, folks. That's about something broken in us, and that's about us trying to live vicariously through them too often. And what we need to do is we need to learn from our Heavenly Father how to say, this is my son and daughter whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. And I pray that if you're a son or a daughter and you had a dad, maybe like Brian's, maybe worse, and they never gave you that sense of love and affection that you need, I pray that you would experience that one from your father. And I pray that God would place men in your life that would speak that type of love and care for your soul. And for all of us who have had great dads, I pray that today we would pause and we would give thanks to God for a dad who through his words and his affections and his affirmations, it framed our world and our universe. And let us trust Christ to help become that type of men that would frame our children's world in a way that would bring glory to the Father in heaven.